Okay, so today we are very lucky to have uh, Bijou Thomas join us. Um, and as you are going to see, he is a restaurateur, but he's someone with many, many talents. And as I roll through a couple things about him, uh, you'll, uh, you'll understand why. He, uh, he started a company uh, that he's working on right now called Mix and Match, and he'll dive into that in a little bit. Uh, he also wrote a uh, cookbook called The Feed Zone. So he's also an author. And he also created, he was a co-founder of Scratch Labs, which we'll touch on um, as well. So as you can see, uh, uh, he is definitely fills the, uh, um, the, he is definitely an entrepreneur. And we're going to get started with uh, my uh, first question. And we're going to focus a lot today on the food business. But first, what I'd like to hear is if you could talk to our audience a little bit about your background. And so you're clearly an entrepreneur, but how did you build your skill set and figure out how to recognize opportunities and, and unmet needs? Yeah, for sure. First of all, thank you so much for having me. And I appreciate everybody taking the time um, to hang in there for a few more minutes and, you know, share this with us. It's very cool. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, I come from a big Indian family. I was born in India. First came to the U.S. in 73 when I was three years old and lived in Denver. And I think that really started the seed of entrepreneurship the way that I know it, which is, you know, always looking for opportunities to either fit in or find a solution to something. And for me, it started with being three years old in a country where I didn't know anybody. We had no family. You know, we were, it was just me and my dad. And then a couple of years later, I went back to India at the age of six when, again, I was in a foreign country and didn't know anybody and didn't speak the language and then came back when I was 10, one more time when everything got juggled up. So for me, it was kind of the MacGyver approach to life was constantly looking for a solution, an immediate solution to a very real and immediate problem. And coming from a big Indian family and most first generation families from anywhere in the world, food is such, you know, the thing that binds us and the one thing that we commonly have as a language among us. And that's why so many families, you know, that they talk about the food and they build businesses around the food because that's one thing that we know and we understand. Um, yeah, so it was just something that I grew up with and being in a big family of food people where we just love to eat and share food and sit down together. And I don't know how many people, current generation people know this, but those of us that grew up in the 70s, 80s, even maybe into the 90s, you never ate until mom and dad were both home and you all sat down together and you ate the same food, you know, so you kind of, there's all those things that kind of taught you how to behave in a small organization, no matter how uncomfortable you were. So it all kind of comes from that. Nice. And it's uh, audience, please throw uh, questions in the chat. The second part of the discussion today, uh, we will, uh, you, you have the opportunity to ask that beach you some questions. So please uh, take the opportunity. Um, so you've had a, a number of successes in a lot of different areas, very kind of disparate uh, industries. So how do you look at entrepreneurship first? And you, you and I talked a little bit about this yesterday and also the idea of failing fast. Sure. Um, this is one of my favorite topics because uh, I've only had two jobs in my life, like two jobs where I got a paycheck. And I started my first company right at when I was 19, started uh, the seeds for it and at 20 we were running. And good, bad, failure, success, it didn't matter for me, having a nine to five job was just not gonna work. Um, and that was partly knowing what my own personality was and knowing that whenever I tried to have a job, I would try to get everybody to quit because my first conversation was, wait, how long have you been here? This is what you've been doing. You know, you can do more than this. And so my instinct always was to get people to leave their jobs and go do something else. So that was never not going to be the option for me. Um, it was always figuring something out on my own. And um, I, I started my first kind of foray into that when I was in my 20s. And, you know, it just kind of kept building from there onward. Getting into food and turning that into a business for me took a while. I knew how to cook. And as you and I talked, I come from the cycling background and uh, grew up as a competitive athlete and always struggled with nutrition for myself. And so it was mostly figuring out, you know, curry and spicy Indian food is not going to fuel a competitive athlete on the endurance side in the US. So a lot of it started there for me, figuring out what was working, what wasn't working. And then 
what I discovered over the years was that all the different things that I do, and you know, there's a, the Feed Zone Cookbook, there's a series of those, there's three in the series. They're sold all over the world in multiple languages. Um, the cycling things that I do, I've worked in some tech. It all connects with sports and fitness and health and wellness, which is kind of the universe that I'm very well knowledgeable of and that I love and that I live in. So it wasn't really, you know, to me internally at least, it wasn't like I was jumping from one completely different topic to another. They were all still things within the same sort of universe of things that I knew and understood fundamentally. And as far as knowing, you know, we talked yesterday about when to burn it down and when to walk away. There are two, I mean, there's many different types of entrepreneurs, but the way that I see it, there are guys that are wired like me or people that are wired like me where we have an abundance of ideas, right? We're always like coming up with an idea, coming up with an idea, which can be really not productive until you get harnessed that and figure out how to work with it. And then there are entrepreneurs who are really have one great vision, one great idea. They will build that thing and get everything out of it for their entire life and hand it off to their kids or their family. So I'm definitely the guy that has multiple ideas and knowing when to torch one and when to walk away or when to let it rest for a little while has been really a process of learning. Awesome. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that more when we get into uh, the curry shop, which I want to dive into the restaurant business now and uh, talk to you a little, spend some time talking about how you started uh, Bijou's little curry shop. And so your approach to this fast casual idea in 2014 was incredibly innovative, right? Chipotle kind of was one of the, 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 the leaders in that category, but you saw an opportunity. So talk us through how you thought about starting this business. What was the opportunity? And then also bringing something that was not really mainstream curry, you know, to, to the fast casual market. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, as you know, Chipotle started uh, right over by DU campus. That was the first one started in the early nineties. And you know, he really, uh, what Steve Ells did really laid the groundwork for that model of restaurant. I mean, we'd all had burritos before and we'd all had Mexican food and we'd all had, but none of us had ever put it into that simple and elegant of a method, right? That everybody could understand. And he'll be the first one to tell you that they're really not selling Mexican food per se. They're selling really delicious food that happens to be Mexican. It's a great value. It's a great, um, you know, easy to understand for everybody in the middle of America who didn't grow up in Colorado with Mexican food. And I wanted to take a similar approach to Indian food because my goal wasn't to create an Indian restaurant. The goal was to create a great neighborhood restaurant, a great a value, really fresh ingredients, thought through, uh, no shortcuts on the food we were doing. And it just so happened to be Indian food. And that's the way that we pitched it from the beginning when I met with my first round investors. And so I think a big chunk of it is, you know, really understanding what your own strengths and what you really lean towards and trying to, at least in the beginning, until you build a network of people and, you know, other folks you can build ideas with, you really have to work on your strengths and play to your strengths to begin with. Um, mine are food and I grew up with Indian food and I know how to make it healthy and clean. That was really all I needed. Steve Ells and Chipotle had already laid out the basic systems that people were open to. So I just needed to find something and put it into that model in the beginning. And that's where we started. So taking that a step further, because I know we have a number of young entrepreneurs on this call. You come up with this idea, you see there's an opportunity in the fast casual space. How do you kind of finding that product fit, right? And, and sure. tell your investors that, you know, there is a huge market out here. Yeah, yeah. Um, for sure, the opportunities were much more easy to identify in 2012, 2013. Uh, 2013 is when I wrote up our business plan and started talking to folks. We had just started Scratch Labs as a business. And for those of you who, I mean, aren't familiar with it, it's a sports nutrition company that we started in Boulder. We launched it as a branded company, Scratch Labs in 2012. And the previous two and a half years, I was on the road all the time. We were building that thing. And I was ready to take a break from being on the road all the time. And I saw an opportunity because no one had yet done fast casual Indian food on a national scale in the US with this one specific brand. And I wasn't building a buffet concept. I wasn't building, I wasn't trying to compete with anyone's grandmother on the menus and the recipes. I just wanted a very simple, clean thing. And the doors are wide open in the, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014. 
you know, at the time, if you look at concepts that were out there, there were Garbanzos and there were Tokyo Joes. Tokyo Joes started long before uh, Chipotle and he started, used to, he might still have one over to you, but, um, you know, nobody had still done Indian food and that was really all it took. And I, the way that I felt, I had just come from a trip in Portland and there's an amazing restaurant there called Bollywood Theater. And Bollywood Theater is on Northeast Alberta, incredible restaurant scene, beautiful restaurant. I was like, good Lord, this is the most amazing restaurant, <clears throat> excuse me, restaurant experience I'd had at an Indian concept in the US and it wasn't owned and operated by Indian guys. I'm like, these are people who fundamentally understand food and customer service. That's really the two things that were missing the way that I saw it in regular Indian restaurants. Food was sometimes great. Customer service was almost always not great. So I saw an opportunity to kind of tone down all the offerings. You don't need a 30 page menu. We had four things on the menu. So the goal wasn't necessarily to overwhelm people with everything, but to really take care of the people that came in the door. And that's really what we started with. So you weren't going for the cheesecake factory size menu? I mean, even thinking about that right now gives me stress. It's just, you know, the volume of thinking that has to go into that. And you think about it, it can't just work one day when the exec chef and the owner is there. It has to work every day, every meal. Every customer coming in is having a very unique and individual experience, usually for the first time. So you can't take for granted that even though you did it perfectly 5,000 times, it has to be perfect the 5,000 and first time. And the way that Chipotle built, or not Chipotle, but Cheesecake and these giant menu restaurants, I walk in and see a restaurant menu like that, I instantly start to like feel panic in my, in my chest. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting when you look at that Chipotle menu and they offer, you know, four or five different offerings, but it's all the same ingredients, just yep. different form factors in the way they, they provide it. Yeah, exactly. Hey, Joshua, I got to step up just for a second. I got to unlock my door. Hold on just a second. Okay. Right. So please throw some uh, questions in the chat. Um, I see we have one so far. Um, so uh, we'll have another about 15 minutes and then uh, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions. Uh, as you'll see with some of my other questions. Sorry about that. FedEx was knocking at the door and they wouldn't just leave the box. So anyway. <laughs> No problem at all. Okay, so we have some students that are in the hospitality and then other students just that are interested in maybe starting a restaurant uh, business. And what I find very fascinating are the economics of the food business. And you go into a fast casual and you, eat, you buy something that's $12 and you're like, that's kind of expensive. But where, where are the economics of it? And where's the margin in that $12 entree that's ordered at the counter? So... When you think about opening a retail restaurant, the margins are so incredibly slim. Um, opening up a Chipotle style restaurant, you're not profitable until you have eight, 10 locations. Either you're profitable at one location where you're there every day, you're controlling everything, you're managing everything, you're managing the hours. As soon as you open two, three, four, you're bleeding money left and right. There's just no way to manage at that scale if you're at that price point. So. Typically with restaurants, you know, you're trying to keep your food, food costs around 30%. You're trying to keep your labor costs around 25 to 30% in a perfect world. Um, that's never going to happen in real life unless the owner operator is there all the time, just because of the employee and labor pool that we're working in. There's a high rate of turnover. It's a very transient labor force, or at least it used to be. And trying to build a, a really stable business around that is so difficult. And then you go into all the things that you really don't know until you've already signed the contracts and signed the leases and hired the employees and all and taken investor money. All of a sudden you're like, man, the, the constant stream of licenses, fees, taxes, permits, this, the little nickel and dime stuff that creeps up on you is unbelievable. And it just doesn't end. And the guy in the, you know, state and county government will follow you, they'll spend $5,000 to get $20, you know, that you may have missed on a tax statement somewhere. So the margins are incredibly thin. If everything goes well, you're at a three to 8% um, of gross is what you're hoping for, but it just doesn't happen. You're more likely on the one and a half to 3% range if you can really manage the restaurant. But like I said, the way to have a, and we all fall into it. We're like, man, I could open 10 more of these. If you want to run a really profitable, successful business where you're making money, you manage your quality of your life, you open one restaurant. 
and you just do that. Open one store and fight the urge to open more. As soon as you open more, it's you're not going to see daylight until five, six, seven more locations. It just doesn't, the metrics aren't there. That's fascinating because I don't think most people, including myself, really think about the, all those different costs that are associated with it. Well, that, that leads into my next question. So your first, your first uh, restaurant was in Rhino, correct? In yeah. 2014. And you saw it has had success. Well, how did you think about expansion in terms of location and mm -hmm. going out and getting funding? Did you go to a bank? Um, and then based on what you said, why did you expand? Yeah, there are a couple of things happened. Part of it, our own success kind of hurt us. Um, we opened in 2014 in Rhino and we were the fourth or fifth restaurant to open on the downtown side of Rhino on the, uh, on the south end. And we opened in an 1100 square foot space. Year one, we did a million two, which is ridiculously high for a restaurant concept like that in a market like Denver. Denver's a B market. We don't have the population density. We don't have the dining habits. That's another thing to think about. Typically in Denver, there's a seating around six o'clock. There might be another one around 7.30 and that's it. Nobody's standing in line in most restaurants in Denver to get dinner at 10 o'clock at night. It's not Chicago, it's not New Orleans, it's not you know New York City where people are still waiting or Dallas even. People are waiting to get a table at 10 o'clock at night. That is not happening in Denver. Denver has one and a half, two seatings max. So. We went into Rhino and we were doing massive numbers that first year. <clears throat> and we were the first ones to really get a lot of national and international press because I had done some TV shows and I do a little bit of writing. So that helped to get us more national coverage, which then brought more restaurants and more brands and spiked the real estate cost. And all of a sudden we went from four restaurants when I opened. By the time we closed in 2015, there's like 150 places to eat within a half a mile of us from, you know, all the way over to Avanti to Denver Central Market to um, Dairy Block. There's so many places to eat that didn't exist. So our sales trickled down. We lost some neighbors that were bringing traffic to us. And at the same time, we had an agreement with Whole Foods to open inside Whole Foods. We were the first outside branded restaurant concept to open in any Whole Foods in the world. And we opened in Pearl Street and Boulder and they wanted to put us nationwide and at that same time, they started negotiations with Amazon. So all the folks that I was dealing with kind of got way overwhelmed and I was kind of there. Now to get a light bulb change, I had to get 40 people on an email chain. So it was one of those things where we had great intentions, great momentum, but everyone else's success along with our success kind of took it, you know, took focus away and took energy away from what we needed. So year one, um, 1100 square feet, a million two in revenue at Rhino. Um, our kitchen wasn't big enough and we really wanted to build our catering business, which when I closed it last year, we we're doing about a half million in just catering. Um, so I built a larger facility on the west side of town to support all of that and to keep growing and keep growing. And yeah, and the unforeseen thing was so much competition came to Denver that if you've been in Denver any length of time, we didn't have a restaurant community really as such until five, six years ago. Yeah, a a absolutely. On that, the restaurant community, um, have, uh, it's it's actually improved quite a bit over the last couple of actually the last sure. ten years. So, what I want to talk about now is, and you and I spoke a little bit of about, about this yesterday. Uh, you had four shops, and from the outside, you were killing it, right? You were yep. you guys were your your company was doing great. Talk us through why you closed down, and also you know bring in the pandemic as well in terms of yep. your thought process. So I had not, I'd been open five years as of um, September, 2019. We had a great run. Um, we are top end numbers and I'm perfectly happy to share any other numbers anybody wants to know. Between the four stores, we're doing about three and a quarter million dollars, which is really pretty good considering what we're selling. We're just a tiny restaurant curry shop business, right? And if you look at fast casual restaurants and even drive through restaurants, Subway is the most you know, number of restaurants in the world, their average store volume or average store revenue is around $360,000. And then you look at the high end of restaurants or fast casual or uh, quick serve fast casual, it's uh, Chipotle is now definitely up there. And I think they've skyrocketed past everybody else. But then you got Chick-fil-A. Chick-fil-A closed on Sundays. They're still doing, you know, two and a half million dollars or so in that range per location, which is massive. 
So then everybody else is in the middle. Wendy's is under a million bucks, uh, or they were before COVID. Um, a lot of local mom and pop shops, you know, little restaurants and stuff. If you're hitting around a half a million dollars in sales, you know, that's a really good number. So for us to be selling a million dollars plus in curry bowls out of a shop was insane numbers. And and we were at the time selling them our ticket, our highest price thing was $11. And our downtown store was doing around 500, you know, tickets a day, 500 um, covers a day. But then our catering and event business really was, you know, that on its own was doing between on a slow year, 300 grand, normal year was 450 to $500,000, which is insane amount of food. So all of that is great. I finally got a chance to close um, during 2019 when my lease ended downtown. I wanted to close for a month, clean up the space, clean up the concept, hire some new staff, reconcept it and relaunch it as one store, one operation, have a clean set of numbers and go get growth partners and turn it into a national brand. That was my entire goal um, ending 2019. 2020, I took my first break in five years, took 10 days off, um, went to Mexico, came back. We had eight days to remodel the restaurant, reopen it. We did that. Um, new staff, new menu format, got away from the Chipotle thing. Our ticket averages went up $8 per ticket overnight because we went to plated food. Same food, just put it in a plate. Um, and we had our best five month or five week run in five years. And then March 12th, it was lights out, COVID hit. We had $80,000 in catering canceled that first weekend. And the way I saw it was we were just gonna get another half a million dollars in cancellations. There's no way we survived that. So I pulled the plug March 18th um, after I had just dumped $30,000 in upgrades uh, five weeks before that. So for me, it was that was the easiest decision I made in five years was deciding to walk away from everything at that point. Because the way that I saw it and having been through enough fluctuations, restaurants can't afford one bad week, much less one bad month. Forget about you know un, unknown number of months. Um, I, I personally didn't have the stomach for it. So based on what you just said, and you were very kind of smart, to, a lot of people would just keep putting money in that this thing's going to turn very quickly. People will come back to the restaurants. Yeah. You made the, you in hindsight, made the right decision. The one thing that I, I'm trying to understand is how are restaurants surviving right now? They're not. Um, I talked to one of my good buddies today. He's got um, a few restaurants in and around Denver, very popular places. And um, we were talking today about how to unwind and get him out of the restaurants because he's like, they're barely breaking even. Um, and, you know, they're open. Most landlords are not working any deals. Even if you're only doing a quarter of the sales, Landlords want 100% of rent. Um, utilities are still the same. Even some of the loans and the, you know, the SBA stuff that you got, unless it was forgiven, uh, rent, for instance, some of the stuff that was forgiven for a little while, now you have to pay all of it, everything that was passed to plus any penalties. So uh, restaurants are really, really in a bad place. And then you take into account all the retail businesses, the boutiques, the gyms, you know, they're all gone. I mean, we were working on such razor thin margins to begin with that I don't know how anybody's, you know, sleeping at night right now that's in that business. But like you and I talked about yesterday, I think that also means there are tremendous opportunities for the next generation of retail business, retail restaurants, anything customer facing, um, people who don't have the legacy of debt and contractual obligations that most of us do. Anybody who can come in with a fresh idea, fresh contracts, I think the sky's the limit for people that can come on the next wave. Interesting. Um, so another thing that we, you brought up when we talked yesterday, and this is a little off topic, but it's around the restaurant business, is your thoughts on the, the new, this debate going on about the new minimum wage and should it sure. be $15? And there's a lot of people say, that's going to just be applied directly to our food prices. Food prices are the cost of meals will go up. What are your thoughts on it? And can restaurants survive if they if they move to a $15? Um, I think it has to be a higher minimum wage. I mean, our, when was the last time our minimum wage was really adjusted for cost of living? I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of ridiculous that we're still having this argument over pennies. Um, yes, the cost of some restaurants uh, menu prices will have to go up. But I think most of us, you know, informed and aware consumers are perfectly okay with the fair hike in price. 
if, you know, if that actually means we get to continue to enjoy something we like. Something that I don't see or hear being talked about enough is that the minimum wage discussion is a favorite, you know, soccer ball to kick around for politicians and policymakers and people who at the high end will literally have no effect on their own life, regardless of what the minimum wage is. When we're talking about minimum wage, we're not talking about the Googles of the world, the Facebook of the world, any tech company. We're not talking about even Amazon warehouse workers. We're literally talking about restaurant employees and first jobs at service industry positions at retail. That's it. So even though everyone likes to talk about minimum wage like it's some big topic, the only people who will have to sort out the burden are mom and pop businesses, mom and pop restaurants, and the employees who start their lives there. So if we could reframe that conversation a little bit and make it you know, sound less like it's some big burden to major corporate America, it isn't. The entire burden is on small retail customer facing businesses. Yes, prices will have to go up. Um, our business from day one, we pulled tips and we made a point that even when tips were low, our employees never walked with less than 15 bucks. And in most cases, they were 17, 18 bucks, um, everybody from the back of the house to the front of the house. Um, I just knew, I would looked at a $50,000 check as an example. $50,000 sounds like a lot of money until you take out taxes as a single person and you're walking with 750 bucks a week, give or take. You can barely cover rent in Denver, forget about anything else. So based on that, $15 an hour for a full-time employee, you're pushing you know, $34,000 a year. You gotta have three other jobs just to like keep the lights on. So $15, we make it sound like it's gonna solve a bunch of problems, it isn't. It's barely getting people to the next step where they can still survive. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna switch now. Um, because I'd be remiss if uh, we didn't talk a little bit about your cooking uh, experiences with the, uh, a number of celebrities. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and please, please, everyone put a couple of questions in the chat, but uh, I have a couple more questions and I'll turn it over to Mina to ask the chat questions from the chat. First, talk about how you got to know Lance Armstrong and your experiences cooking with Lance. Yes, yeah, so I grew up uh, riding and racing bikes. I um, started working in restaurants and racing bikes when I was 15 here in Denver. And I grew up with a bunch of folks that none of us, you know, we were all bike dorks. At the time, the only people that rode and raced bikes were bike geeks who had no other friends. Um, now you can open up anybody's garage in Denver and they got a $5,000 bike in there. So we all kind of stayed friends and stayed together. We had a little community. In the late nineties, I saw an opportunity to cook for cyclists. Um, I had heard of chefs for NBA players and NFL players, but nobody in the cycling universe. And I thought that there was an opportunity to do that. There was no money in it. So I was doing home remodels at the time, painting homes, you know, putting up fences or whatever I could to make money. And then I would take that money and go cook for free for uh, cycling teams and running teams and collegiate teams and all this. So I did that for a long time because I wanted people to think of me as the guy who was doing it, even though nobody else was doing it. Um, I talked my way into cooking for some of the Bronco charities um, the Nuggets, and when the Colorado Avalanche team started that first first season, first generation team here, I cooked for those guys all the time. When they left the U.S. to go overseas, I made all their dinners. So I wanted to build a brand as the guy for sports and fitness. That worked. Um, I connected back up with, uh, or I met up with Alan Lim, who is the founder. He's a PhD out of Boulder, physiology. He was Olympic team coach. He and I are co-authors on the books. Um, he had gotten hired to go be Lance's um, physiologist when Lance was coming back, Lance 2.0 in 2007 or eight. And he really wanted to rethink his food and his approach to diet. So that was an easy one for me. So I went along. The first time I meet him is I get out of the car and uh, meet him in Hawaii at Kona at the house. And then we ended up you know, working together over the years many times. And I've been part of that community since 2007 or eight now, yeah. Nice. What about Elon Musk? What was that experience like? What, so, kind, of wine did, what kind of wine does he drink? Uh, Elon's awesome, man. You think you're going to meet, uh, you know, the way he comes across in um, interviews when he's like really just buzzing with energy and life and, you know, he's very chaotic, at least the way it seems like he's just, his mind isn't, that's how he is all the time. It's, it's, it's incredible. Um, it's super cool. I got, I'm friends with Elon's brother, Kimball Musk, who owns a bunch of restaurants in and around Colorado, the kitchen restaurants, kitchen next door. 
and um, you know, gotten to be friends with the people in that group. And so got invited out to come and cook um, for, the, for the group there last year. Wonderful, it was amazing. So and the funny thing is that the night that I had to leave, I was cooking a buddy of mine's wedding in Boulder. And I was like, listen, I'm gonna cook the wedding, but I'm leaving as soon as it's done. Flew straight to LA, um, I got, and I had to start the next morning. So it was one of, one of a life, you know, once in a lifetime opportunity to do that and I wasn't gonna miss it. Did and he, apparently uh, now he's the richest guy in the world. So, you know, that's pretty cool. Did he pay you in Tesla shares? <laughs> no. I got paid in good old-fashioned dollars. We're pretty good too. That's and it's, awesome. it's crazy. Like the time that I was there, they were definitely going through. You know, SpaceX was going through some issues. Um, you know, they were really getting ready to really blow up in a good way. And the Model Three. I remember a, a friend of mine works really close with him. That's how I was connected. And she was out there taking care of him during that time because he was living at the office at the plant when the Model 3 um, plant issues were happening. Remember, there was a time they're like, everybody was writing off Tesla, Elon sucks, Tesla sucks, everybody sucks. And he was sleeping on a vinyl sofa at the office with just a throw a blanket, fully dressed all the time. He was living there. And a friend of mine here in Denver, she helps with a lot of his stuff and she was running back and forth and making sure he was you know, fed and sleeping and getting to all the meetings and all the things and it's nuts, yeah. I remember hearing some of those stories. That's awesome. Uh, so Amina Penn, if you want to throw on your uh, camera, I work, uh, she's going to ask the Q&A. So, Hi, Amina. Uh, Thank you. I'm sorry. I'm very verbose, so feel free to cut me off. No problem. Thank you so much for sharing your story. It was wonderful to hear. Um, so I'm just going to go through some of the questions and call out those who are willing to ask their questions. So I'm gonna start with Noah Binstock and um, his questions about how you started to begin with. So Noah, if you would like to ask your question live. Hi, uh, first of all, Mr. Thomas, I appreciate you taking the time to do this presentation. Um, also appreciate you putting the stickers in the Excite Lab a few years ago, yeah. got them all over my uh, water bottles and laptop. Um, That's awesome. I guess that question was kind of answered, but I do have another question. You brought up, you know, some entrepreneurs have one idea and stick to it. Others have a lot of ideas, but it's not really effective until you can harness one of them. What were the key indicators that you found when it was time to move on? Um, yeah. You know, the difference between ad adversity and sticking through and realizing when to pull the plug. Yeah, for sure. Um, on the restaurant side, it's really complicated to figure that out because you're never really making a lot of money, but you're spending a lot of money. And it takes so much time and energy and then my name's on it. So there's a lot of like other pressures to make it work or to keep it going and keep it going and keep it going. Um, but at the end of the day, when COVID came up, the way that I saw it, you know, I'd grown up in the restaurant business and I'd grown up working in restaurants and I, I know everyone that's currently active in the restaurant business in Colorado and Denver. And so many of us have just been struggling, even successful restaurants. You're never not just on the throttle all the time. So the way that I saw it was, you know, it's gonna suck, it's gonna hurt. I personally am out, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars, but this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to like take a break, take a breath and really evaluate what the upside of sticking with this is. You know, is it really the number of dollars we're gonna make? Is it the quality of life that's gonna improve? Am I really changing something in the food or general landscape as far as cultural conversation? Or am I just feeding my own ego at this point? And it was a really difficult conversation I had to have because there's other things I want to do with my life. There's other things I want to pursue. There's friends of mine that I want to support. And, you know, staying in the trenches and trying to make it work, especially with the restaurants, that was an easy decision for me to walk away from. Other things we've done over the years, you know, there's, and I started businesses when I was 20. One of my partners died, that imploded on my first company. So all of them, there's, I think there's plenty of uh, signs along the way when something's not working. Um, and often I think when something is working, it's really hard to tell because you're just in the groove, everything's clicking along. And until you get validation, you don't know if it's working or not. But yeah, I, I just think you got to trust your gut and know what your pain threshold is and really what the upside is if you stick with it. Thank you. Yeah, I assume that a global pandemic kind of helped affirm that decision. Um, <laughs> I assume you have a lot of new ideas that you're thinking about pursuing. 
I know you have a lot of other projects, but what are the main indicators you're looking for from those new decisions that, you know, can help validate one over the other? Sure. One of the things I learned, um, especially with the restaurant, was going forward, I personally need to have um, an operating partner. I need to have a co-founder with me. Um, just because there's so many moving parts once you start the business. And more specifically, the minute you have employee number one, um, that's a, a W-2 employee, the business entirely changes. You're no longer, now, whether you're busy or not, whether you feel like working or not, that employee wants a check every week, right? So the business dynamic changes entirely. So going forward, the projects I'm picking and the things that I'm committing to, getting money is easy. Uh, getting investor money is easy once you have an idea, once you have a little bit of a network built or whatever it is you need to do. There's plenty of money out there, whether it's SBA money, friends and family, whatever. What isn't out there is a co-founder and a partner. So you really need to find someone to share the burden, share the journey, and ultimately share the success with. So the things that I'm picking going forward are definitely built around teams and people that I enjoy being around and people that I can see really committing my life to. So, yeah. Those are great points. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Noah. Thank you, Noah. I'm going to then go on to Brendan. Um, really great question. I personally have a follow-up question after that. So, Brendan, if you want to take it away. Yeah, um, I'd, of course, like to uh, echo what Noah said. Thank you so much for doing this. It's been awesome so far. Um, but I really, I, I'm interested to know, how do you come up with, like, a menu for like a fast casual uh, Indian restaurant concept? Like how do you choose specifically what dishes are gonna be on the menu so that you have like a balance of like food that people might know versus food that people might not know? Um, like what is the process for that? Dude, that's such a great question. Are you uh, in the restaurant or in the hospitality space or are you looking to do that? I'm actually a pre-law student. I'm just really interested nice. in the topic. Yeah, so what it came down to for me was up front, I knew I wasn't gonna do any of the regular things. I figured that was going to be PR and press for me. So you got to, especially now, we got to pay attention to, you know, getting as much PR bang for everything we do, right? So just doing what people were used to was not going to get me any PR or press. So I knew up front, definitely not doing a buffet of any sort. Um, there was nothing on my menu that people knew. There was no naan, there was no chicken tikka masala, no butter chicken, no paneer, nothing was on there that anybody knew. And I wanted to leverage that for press and media coverage and it 100% worked. So, and then the other thing you gotta come back to is at the end of the day, if you're looking at any sort of a, an operation that requires mechanics, you know, people moving and doing something and assembling something, um, especially at entry level pay scale, um, you've gotta really build something where you can get the most, you know, the best experience for the customer, the best service, the best product, considering you'll be working with most likely the least skilled employees. You might get one or two great employees along the way, but two, three, four years in, you're not gonna be able to rely on that. So you've gotta build the model for the best possible customer experience where that the least skilled person can pull off, right? So you, and especially as a restaurateur, the last thing we wanna do is build something that was, I could only do. I mean, because I can't be there 24 seven, right? So the menu then becomes uh, uh, an iteration of that. How do I make the best possible experience with the least number of moving parts that I can train somebody who's never stepped into a kitchen before to do? That's really what informed how to build the menu and build the systems in place to do that. Uh, and it worked. I mean, we got tremendous coverage and press and media. We still get press and media, which is crazy. Uh, one of my old cooks is doing something uh, on Food Network, and uh, we're in the New Jersey Times today for some reason. Um, so, but that, that was really it. If you think through food, keep it really uncomplicated, unless you're planning to be there open to close for the next five and a half years, um, and most likely you're not going to. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brendan. Deja, I actually have a follow-up question with that. How were you able to ensure that quality of your food remained consistent as you expanded and growed over the years? Sure. Um, so when we opened my second store, my first store, I was there open to close every single day for the first year and a half. And as we got more business and more, um, you know, we were more in the conversation, we knew we had to grow. So I opened up our second location, which we built a production kitchen in. 
So all the core items we produced at our second store with my cooks that were there for five years with me. So they made all the base, everything every day. And then we got those delivered to each location. And then at the store level, um, the staff there just had to finish the dishes. So we took the, you know, the pressure off of having to know everything from the beginning. We built our own internal commissary kitchen model. So everything fed out of our own central kitchen, but everything was still made fresh. Everything was still, you know, we use uh, local ingredients as far as the proteins, the chicken and the beef and all that. But we had to keep it simple and so that the employees at the store level could focus on customer service as much as possible. Great, no, thank you for your question. That's very insightful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I have David um, regarding food trucks versus mortar restaurants. So David, would you like to speak up? Sure. So I asked this sitting in um, Old Town Fort Collins and looking at it from a commercial property owner point of view, knowing real estate taxes are so heavy in Colorado. How do you react to the regulation of food trucks versus brick and mortar locations? Is it fairly managed when you see a food truck parked out in front of a, a restaurant that you know is paying through the nose to support its property tax? Yeah, I found that to be a really difficult one for us because I went into Broadway Market with uh, a bunch of other friends of ours. And, you know, the buildup costs going into uh, brick and mortar space, plus, you know, all the other commitments you got to get to to get there are ridiculously high. And but then we turn around every week, there's a huge food truck festival on our block. And that was like insanely like frustrating. So I think there's a way for everyone to obviously get and live well together, but there does, what's the regulation like now in Fort Collins? Is there, is it just open? Oh, I there? think they, I think they say the food truck has to move every, you know, periodic yeah. interval, but move means they could pull forward a van's length and right, right. satisfy yeah. that requirement. So I know in Denver for food trucks to be parked anywhere, they got to have specific permits for specific locations. Mm -hmm. And they try their best to do that where there aren't already restaurants, um, you know, parked and doing that. But well, right now what we're going to see is post COVID, we're going to see a significant reduction in brick and mortar restaurants operating. So I think food trucks can fill a gap for a while, but there's just no way to really compete with how nimble food trucks can be and a food truck can run for two, three months. And if the business doesn't work, they can just close it up and go on, right? They can sell the truck and be done with it. Brick and mortar, you're screwed. You got a minimum five-year lease on your hands. And unwinding that is not that easy. So I definitely think, you know, we all love food trucks. We love food truck festivals. But as an owner-operator, it's a really, really big challenge and a really big struggle. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, sir. All right, next we have Bobby's question. Uh, yeah, I was curious. So um, I've noticed self uh, self employment's gone way down in America, and I've been wondering, uh, exclusive from COVID, over the past few years, have you found it it's become harder to uh, create or run a business in America? And do you expect it's going to become harder still, or do you uh, think it'll be easier over time? Um, and by self employed, do you mean like a, a brick and mortar business owner, or just somebody who's like an entrepreneur, kind of doing their own thing? I believe uh, the statistic was uh, particularly for a brick and mortar, but this extends yeah. as far as it can. Yeah, you know, you, if you look at the trends on brick and mortar spaces and small businesses like that, there's been definitely a boost of gyms and studios and that's been massive. Restaurants have gone up. Up until COVID, people are opening up things left and right, left and right. But at the same time, the market, there's only so many people to go around, right? Like if people aren't going to, we don't need 80 gyms in a squ one square mile. We don't need 800 restaurants. And that's the reality of it. And we had talked about that within the restaurant community here for the last five years of like, we already have too many restaurants, but you can't tell somebody fresh out of culinary school or somebody who's starting their life with a great idea, great support and great fan base. Like, dude, this is probably not the best time. I mean, that's, you know, there's no way to tell people not to do it. Um, that's not fair. That's their own journey and that's their own um, dream to pursue. But I definitely believe there was a massive explosion of spaces and businesses that nobody really needed. And COVID, as we've seen, I mean, so many people have had to close and lose their life, you know, life's, uh, you know, all their wealth that they built up or whatever they did have built up. Um, on the other hand, as far as self-employed people, in particular, not the gig industry per se, but 
Um, there are so many opportunities to do business and build something with all the tools available right now. So I write for a few magazines and I contribute as an editor. Uh, one of the things we constantly talk about, and I, I specifically am in the sports, wellness, fitness, nutrition space, there is a massive shortage of content. Every magazine, every newspaper out there needs stuff every single day, right? There just isn't good content out there that can keep fulfilled. So for people that are looking to get their personal brand name out there and willing to build a story and then maybe also have a product in brick and mortar down the road, the opportunities are you know, limitless. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, we have one last or two of questions in the chat. Um, so next is Beth and about your success. So Beth. Hi, Biju. So well, hello, Beth. A little bit, but if you want to expand upon it, you know, I was just curious to what you attribute your success with each of the businesses you've started. Is it really having this bulletproof idea that's incredibly unique or maybe the people that you work with and hire or something else entirely? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, restaurants, uh, if anybody's working in the restaurant business in Denver or anywhere for that matter, there's so many variables and everything that starts off with great intentions and a great team and a great idea, you know, your first bad day and it all comes, you know, crumbling in. So you definitely need to have a great team, but to what I was uh, speaking to Noah earlier, I think you really, as far as the systems and the concept in place, don't overcomplicate things or overwhelm things or try to build, you know, something that's purely built on what you individually can do. It ultimately has to be something that you can execute with any available staff, any available day of the week, that sort of thing. So once you, you know, reduce it down to something that can be executed simply, elegantly with the best possible result for the customer, then it becomes easy to scale that up. And the books, you know, we didn't really talk about that, but my books are a perfect example of this. There's three of these things. They're seemingly complicated ideas, but every single recipe in there is just common ingredients, everyday items, two to three steps you can make with whatever equipment you have. That's why they've been incredibly successful. There's nothing in there that I wrote for another chef. I wrote it for normal everyday people to really get something out of. And I think of everything that way. How can I really simplify and make it really accessible? Thank you, Beth. Thank you. Alrighty, one last question to hit it home. Um, Brendan? A little bit less of a entrepreneurship focused question. And I didn't actually realize you had cookbooks that you published that kind of maybe answers the question right there. Um, but from your time with um, Bijou's Little Curry Shop, did you like come up with any specific like favorite recipes that you had um, that maybe you uh, would recommend someone else like trying out making? <laughs> um, that is a great idea, sir. Uh, what I did do, so we started up this thing called Mix and Match where I do online cook-alongs and now we have clients nationwide and Again, this thing there is like to take really complicated seeming dishes and ideas and reduce it down to two or three steps. So um, that's really it. The, like the latest thing we're doing this year, taking a bunch of different vegetables and stuff, putting it all, keeping you know the roast, the beets in one corner, the potatoes in one corner, keeping all, all the different things separately, drizzle it all in olive oil. It all goes in the oven at the same time. And then it comes out at the same time. You make this giant platter of beautiful, colorful food they just sit down and eat with your friends. That's one of the simplest things, but I'll show you a book. They're called The Feed Zone. There's three of these. I don't normally hawk books, but um, wait, where is it? There it is. The Feed Zone. This is the last one. Um, they're sold all over the place, and they're, or you can look them up online. There's tons of free recipes. If you like to cook, really, really simple, easy, beautiful stuff. Enjoy, sir. Thank you so much. I will. Thanks, I will Thank you. Right away. <laughs> You just call me out there, Bijou. I probably take like five different vegetables every night, put olive oil on. That's my dinner. Every it's like the best thing ever. You just, uh, yeah. and this year I was like, no one's got time. Like, especially if you're living at home with your family or working at home and school at home and kids, no one's got time. Like take a bunch of stuff, put on a giant pan, put it in the oven, come back an hour later, you got dinner. Exactly. There you go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, well, thank you so much. And for all of you all for participating in the discussion, really appreciate your questions and your answers, Bijou. Thank you, thank you very much, this is lovely. Thanks, Amina, I have one more question because we have a little bit of time. Amina, I appreciate you handling all the Q&A. Take COVID out of it, 
to Saturday, where are you going? Where's your go-to restaurant? Where's that hole in the wall that you're going to tell us all about? And then we're going to <laughs> try. All right. So non hole in the wall, one of my favorite restaurants and, you know, place that, I mean, it's open, but place that I absolutely love is Hop Alley in Rhino on the North end of Rhino, the most amazing, you know, the best um, Chinese food, you know, very obviously hipster upscale, but just such an amazing place to go sit at the bar, have a, you know, share something with somebody, not a hole in the wall, but as far as hole in the wall places go, you know, on, I grew up in Lakewood, so it was always close to federal. That's where all the Asian markets were that we went to. And um, Jay's Noodles over there is amazing. If you guys haven't been to, it used to be called Swing Thai. It's just on the other side of Wash Park. Um, he reopened a place called Hey Bangkok. Um, amazing food, Thai food at a walk-up counter. It's right at um, Alameda and Broadway. Hey Bangkok, they do delivery. The food is incredible. They do crispy Thai chicken. They do his fried uh, tofu. I love it. And then um, I do love dim sum over, you know, over on Federal. I do love that stuff. I'm usually easy. I just want like um, really cheap, dirty Mexican food or cheap, messy Asian food. That's my favorite. Yeah, that Jay's noodle has been there forever. You never want to really sit down in there. It's more, it's better of a take it better. Yeah, for sure. It, it's so good though, man. And then, you know, you go to, uh, um, oh man, uh, can't think of it now, but the Tacos New Mexico over on 8th and Santa Fe, Yep. Uh, over in that neighborhood. Oh my God. My dad used to take me there when I was a kid. Tacos New Mexico. Well, you and I are going to hook up for dim sum, not on a Saturday or Sunday, because all those places on Federal are impossible to get into on a Saturday and Sunday. The yeah. Exactly. Tuesday at 1130. Um, hey, well, thank you, everybody. Uh, mute your uh, microphones really quick. Let's give uh, Bijou a big round of applause and a big thank you for, uh, for coming on. We really appreciate it. Hey, thank, thank you. you very much. And uh, thanks for spending some time with us. And uh, everyone, uh, we uh, keep an eye out for the next speaker series. And uh, Bijou, thanks. And uh, be safe and well. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bijou. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you guys so much.